Hello everyone, I'm John Evans. Welcome to another episode of One on One. People know Bill Vassar as the head of EUE Screen Gem Studios in Wilmington, the largest full service television and film production facility on the East Coast. What they may not know is that Bill's career in electronic media started almost 50 years ago. He's been with EUE Screen Gems now for 20 years. He worked at NBC Studios in New York for years on productions that include The David Letterman Show. Bill got his start in radio as a teenager, much like I did years ago, which made our conversation like a walk down memory lane. When I was a kid in grade school, junior high school, I imagined the, the, the classrooms as the studios at NBC in New York. Oh, really? And I was such a fan of the network from such a, at such a, at such a young age that I could tell you what was being done in what studio, um, what studios were being turned around to be used two, three times in a day. And um, so, yeah, I imagined it very young, mm -hmm. but I never imagined I would be there. Yeah. Um, and I just I had a fascination with radio and television from the time I was a young young kid. Yeah, you you said uh, that you were at my first job uh, in broadcasting itself was I was 15. It was a high school job in summer of my high school. Right. My dad knew the guy who owned the small little radio AM radio station. Used mm -hmm. to go off the air when the sun went down. <laughs> my first. You're one the too. same way. Yeah. Yeah. First one was at WRYM in New Britain, Connecticut. Paul Manafort Sr. was the uh, mayor at the time. Really? Yes. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I started hanging around stations when I was 13, 14 years old, and I had my FCC license by the time I was 15 because you needed a license yep, you needed to, to take be a on test. the air and take the, yep. take the meter readings. Yep, yep. And um, I just started hanging around stations, and you know, I would do anything. I'd go for sandwiches, I'd sweep the floor, anything to be there. And eventually, one of the stations I was hanging around let me go and play in the production studio. So by the time I was 15, 16, I had been trained. Mm -hmm. And I had a job waiting for me on my 16th birthday. Now, that sounds like a big deal today. But in 1969, the FCC had just said, AM, FM stations, if you own both in a market, you have to separate the programming. Yeah. So there were all these jobs. There weren't broadcast schools. There weren't a lot of majors in, 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 in mm -hmm. radio and TV in college. So basically anybody who could come in and operate the board <laughs> yeah. could get on the air. Yeah. And it was a much different time because the formats weren't so structured. Yeah. When I think of the fact that this was a quote-unquote good music station and every other song you played was an instrumental and then you rotated male-female group, but I had total control over what those were from those from that bin of records. Mm -hmm. So you were actually creating an interesting artistic product, yeah. uh, much different than it is today in radio. And it was just such a wonderful time. And the, yeah. the thing was, get to the next bigger station. Mm -hmm. And so by the time, before I turned 17, I was working at the big Top 40 station in Hartford. And it was just kind of a miracle. Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I remember those days as, I mean, now we're generating content and we're putting it on web. Like this podcast will be on web. It'll be on mm -hmm. uh, audio versions. It'll be everywhere on Roku. But, you know, we were just generating two and three hour programs at a exactly. time. Exactly. And, and no one's thinking of it as content. No. It was like, we have to keep the radio station on the air and the yeah. sales guy has to go out and sell some advertising yeah. and we have to break even at the end of the year. Yeah. It was really amazing being in that and, and seeing that. So you had that start, and then you worked at a bunch of stations. <laughs> Too many. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you grew up in Massachusetts, right? Born in Massachusetts. By the time I got the air job, we'd moved to Connecticut. Okay. So I'd start hanging around stations in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and uh, actually hung around a wonderful NBC affiliate, uh, WWLP, Channel 22 in Springfield, which was owned by um, an eccentric. and uh, <laughs> Family-owned television. Family-owned television. Yeah. Um, you know, he went and asked the family for half a million dollars to get it on the air in 1952. And he, he was uh, an eccentric. He was a... Uh, 
wilderness person. He hiked. He charted the like the 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 northwest portion of the the, the, the mountains in Canada. <laughs> uh, he was head of the American uh, Al- uh, Appalachian uh, Trail Association. Right. And um, he actually was somebody who, in World War II, he was in a group of guys that they would drop out of a plane behind enemy lines with skis on their back, and they'd ski down and invade towns. He had two Purple Hearts, and he went to Harvard. Wow. So, <laughs> that's a, what a great learning experience that was. Well, he, and and he was very open about people just coming and hanging around. But wow. I'll never forget. I was hanging around, and I said, "I'd like to work here." He goes, "Okay, I got some." Uh, woods that needs to be chopped out back. It was like, <laughs> everyone's going to start Everyone. where I've got the lowest rowing job. Yeah. And um, I never never worked there, but I just saw his dedication mm-hmm. to the community. Uh, when I was in eighth grade, he did an editorial every day. Every day. Every day. It was a promise he made to his father when his father funded the station that uh, his father, who was a pr- pretty much a liberal Democrat in the, in the 30s and was mayor of the town, and the newspaper was very Republican. In fact, when there really was uh, uh, yeah. a difference in editorial opinions based on who owned the media outlet, and they would constantly tear this guy apart in the eight years that he was mayor. And he said, you have to promise me we'll take the family views and get them on the air and in an editorial form every single day. Wow, what a charge <laughs> that was. It was. And eventually they had to change it from uh, editorial to uh, Bill Putnam reports okay. because it was very slanted and they weren't given <laughs> equal time. <laughs> there wasn't a board. It was just him yeah, putting it, it all him. together. You went to Fordham University. Short period of time. I started actually at uh, Manchester Community College okay. in Manchester, Connecticut. And uh, What did you uh, study? Radio and TV because it was the easiest. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, I didn't actually graduate from there. Mm-hmm. And being involved in the industry was just was taking too much time and I didn't have time and I'm like why am I going to college if I'm already doing new I mean in high school uh, I worked at a station where I did uh, production and the afternoon show and it was a big 50,000 watt FM station and uh, in the mornings I was sent to cover Governor Meskel at the the governor's office in Hartford yeah so So, you're you're in at that point in time your foot is already in the door anything you want me to do and on top of that I was always the guy that got called on a fill-in so I could be working two or three four stations at a time under different names between Hartford and Springfield New Haven and Springfield and so like oh call Vance or he'll fill in for two days yeah (laughs) and, and it sounds so much like mine because I remember yeah, you know, I remember learning how to edit audio tape with a razor blade and scotch tape. Want to see the scars? Yeah, yeah. I remember, you know, literally slip cueing forty five records, and the the commercials were on the uh, little cassettes that looked like eight track tapes at yep. the time. You're taking me back to a time in radio when I first began. But you worked fifteen years before you answered an ad, roughly. 15, but you answered an ad for NBC yeah, or something like that? Yeah. How did that I, work? I didn't know it was NBC. It, it was, was a blind a, ad? No, I, I had progressed up the line in, in radio to the point of running stations, and I was working for the Boston Globe in Westchester County, and the station was changing hands, and the new owners, they don't want to keep the, the, the lead guy on. Right. And I was 28 years old. Um and uh, I got fired, and then I joined another station on Long Island for about a year. Same thing happened. They got absorbed, and I was out the door. And uh, my wife saw an ad in the New York Times, and that's when the New York Times was two inches thick with classifieds oh. on Sunday. Wow. And that's where you found a job. Yeah. There, there, was no, there was no online looking. It was all networking or the New York Times. And she suggested that I, I, I look in the Times. I said, there are no jobs for what I offer in the New York Times. So she picks it up and she's going through and she goes, what's an affiliate relations person? I said, well, that's the person that works for a network that makes sure that the programming gets cleared so the network's commercials get the maximum amount of uh, exposure. Mm -hmm. And well, what does it involve? I said, well, it involves the keeping in touch with the stations. And but for the most part, it's when the sales manager and the general manager come to New York. You, after they're going to the agencies, you take them out to uh, dinner with their wives, and then you send them off to a Broadway show. She goes, it sounds like a perfect job for you. <laughs> so I applied for the job um, through this blind box ad, 
And it said inquiries only, and I was fairly assertive, and I found my way through to the person handling the job. And she said, you know, your resume is right here on my desk, and if it was a radio job, I'd send you over there, but it's for television. And I said, well, who's it for? And uh, she said, it's for NBC. Now, this is 1984, mm -hmm. way before The Cosby Show. <laughs> Yeah. Months before the Cosby Show took it from worst to first, yeah. they were so far behind in the ratings and in, in, in um, behind ABC and CBS. There was no Fox, right at this point. Yeah, <laughs> right. hey, come on, yeah. And um, I said, oh, I, oh, I, I get it. I said, uh, you're going to have stations. They get to the end of the month. This network's not drawing viewers. They've got to make their numbers for the corporation. So they'll dump Friday and Saturday night programming, cut up a movie and run four times as many commercials and sell it to three car dealerships. And she goes, oh, you seem to understand. I said, <laughs> I sold advertising. I yeah. competed in radio. I knew what the game was. Yeah. She goes, well, let me talk to him. Mm. Sent me over. I got the interview. I went through personnel. I started telling personnel what I knew about the history of NBC and Tuscanini and the NBC Orchestra and how Sarnoff made radio credible in the 30s. Yeah. And personnel was like, oh, okay, yeah. So they, I had three interviews for the affiliate, uh, affiliate relations job. And personnel said, call us such and such a time on Thursday. Uh, I called and they said, we have bad news and we have what could be good news. And I said, well, give me the bad news. You're one of two final candidates for the job, but it went to a TV guy. But we have this other job that's been open for about six months, and they haven't looked outside the network, but we told the person about you that's hiring, and she wants to talk to you. I said, well, what's the job? They said, well, we don't fully understand it, but it has something to do with excess capacity in the studios and excess time in the shops and uh, taking the mobile units and renting them out to other people when they're not being used by sports. And it was the person that handled the sales for the studios and such at NBC. Yeah. And I'm like, I've always wanted to work in television. Yeah. I never dreamed I could have a job possibly in the same uh, uh, range of compensation that I had achieved in radio and it was like yeah I'd like to interview yeah <laughs> I had one 50-minute interview well, and she did most of the talking <laughs> and now when I went for the affiliate relations job this sh it's like way up on the 60th floor overlooking the Hudson River you know it, it looked it still looked like Mad Men yeah um, right. and even though it was 1984 so I take the interview for this other job and it's down on the fourth floor and it's, you know, she had a nice office, you know, mm -hmm. she had a little living room set and big desk and a credenza and overlooked the skating rink. But I'm thinking, fourth floor, this is, it can't be as good. Yeah. Um, and I noticed that the men were all dressed in sport coats and slacks, so I figured they couldn't be as important as the guys upstairs. Who were in the suits. In the suits. Right. And right next to the people that ran the network. Um, and what I found out was these were the people who made television. And it was in the entertainment division at NBC, so I was in the same small management group with Saturday Night Live and David Letterman and Another World, the soap opera yeah, that was oh on yeah. for years, and any other entertainment programming that got produced from New York, Macy's Parade, uh, when Bob Hope would do the uh, Heisman Trophy Award, he would do it in New York as part mm -hmm. of the Christmas special. And... Um, one of the, and then I also, I, I got that job yeah. with one 20 minute interview. Right. And a lesson to young kids when somebody, when you interview and they ask you to do something, just mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. Um, this woman hired me and said, call me Thursday at 11 o'clock. Okay, okay. So I called her, it's back to dial telephones. Right. Oh yeah, the rotary phones. So it would <laughs> ring exactly at 11 o'clock. <laughs> and she answered her own phone and she went, I said, hi, it's Bill Vassar. You asked me to call you. I don't know what I'm going to do. Hangs up the phone. Oh. Women had to be gruff in those days. It was really, if yeah. you, you're, it was a man's world. Oh, yes, it was. And NBC was, probably had more female executives than any of the networks, um, which changed a little bit under GE. But um, uh, I figured, all right, once a bridesmaid, never a bride. Yeah, right. I didn't get the job. 40 minutes later, personnel calls me and says, she wants you to start on Monday. <laughs> I said, I thought when I talked to her at 11, she wasn't interested and was blowing me off. She goes, no, no, she had narrowed it to you and one other person. You called at 11, that person called at 1120. Oh, there you go. <laughs> you wow. followed instructions. Yeah. And it was a great situation because I knew nothing about how to put a television show together. 
They said, go out there and find clients, <laughs> yeah. make cold calls, bring them in, and we'll assign a production manager, a budgeter, to work with you to do the budget. And then by osmosis, being around here, being with the production managers and such, mm -hmm. um, you'll learn. So what were, some of the, what were some of the productions you got involved with in that job? The first show, and even though Willard Scott was on the Today Show, he had signed a deal with Westinghouse to resurrect the old Art Linkletter's house party. Oh, okay. And we did a pilot for that with a little band and Willard being Willard. And yeah. uh, it, it didn't take, but that was the first one. We also got involved with uh, business to business corporate video conferencing, okay. which was a big deal where you would put on a show somewhere and they would take it to hotels around the country. Uh, a lot of pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. and uh, Is that when you did the, were you were involved with the Limbaugh show at that point in time too? Would that no, that was in? later on when I went oh, to another company. On. Oh, okay. Um, right. uh, I, I left NBC after about five years. I went to uh, a company called Times Square Studios. They had rec tried to recruit me for a couple of years. And uh, there was a strike at NBC in 1987 where the technicians walked out for about 17 weeks. And they... Uh, put out a memo to management and said, do you have any experience, you know, working in the studio? I wrote back, no, but I worked in radio for X number of years. I know how to run audio equipment. Mm -hmm. So a month later, I get, a, get back my assignment to go to audio scab school. So, <laughs> oh, it was great. Oh, really? We can, we're running the network. Oh. We don't know what we're doing. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, uh, uh, I went to audio school, then to uh, audio mixing school, and graduated top five and went to audio uh, music mixing school. <laughs> and I ended up with the assignment to, to mix Letterman. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know what I was wow. doing. The tech manager comes in to me and goes, you don't want the job. I go, oh, yeah, I want the job. This is like my favorite show of all time. Yeah. It's like the fourth or fifth year of the show. Yeah. Was he still doing mornings at that point, or was he already at No, night? he was. He'd, he'd was, already, gone he'd already been signed to that. You know, he did yeah. the morning show. Silverman signed him to that five-year yeah. agreement yeah. to kind of be a threat for Carson, which, of course, he wasn't. Yeah. Um, and he was doing game shows. Because I remember when he was actually on in the morning. Oh. When he was on, like, it wasn't long, but it started as a morning show, 20, like 10 in the morning. 26 weeks. Yeah. Cut from 90 to 60 minutes after 13 weeks. Yeah. And there was a lot of turmoil at the network at the time. And yeah. they lost their programming executive who would sit w and watch him because NBC on the show. And it kind of went from a talk show to a satire Mm -hmm. of a talk show. I think he started to find his voice at that point, yeah. just the wrong time of day. Yeah. And so I have so, such, such great memories. Oh, no, yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, you were, uh, uh, in Syracuse, you were a radio general manager? Or was that I uh, actually 95X? Was 95X, I was a part owner of the station. Part owner? Uh, I went into business with an old buddy of mine who I'd known since we were 16. And uh, his family had some money, and his dream was always to run a station. He had been a successful programmer in major markets. And uh, we went in on the station. Mm -hmm. And um, Was that your first taste of really kind of higher up in no, media? No, I, I had done that for other companies oh, okay. like, the, like right. the Globe. But it was the first time of being crossing the line into you've got to perform for the bank who you got the loan from. Okay. Um, and we were successful at what we were, what we planned to do, and we did make the station number one with adults, uh, adult males, 2554. But the way we got there was totally different than the radio I understood that I was in 10 years prior. Mm -hmm. And so we achieved this, and my partner took me out to lunch, and he said, you're not happy, are you? I, I'm really not. He said, do you know why? I said, I can't really put my, my thumb on it. He said, we did this, and we did this through focus group testing, testing the music, making sure the right stuff was being played. We branded the station a certain way. We gave away ten thousand dollars twice for playing ten, not playing ten in a row, or ten thousand right. dollars, and we manipulated our way to the top. He goes, "You remember radio when it was an art? Yeah. Now it's a science, and you just don't like it." And yeah. I went. You nailed it. He goes, I want to buy out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, and I was fine because yeah. I, I understood what was going yeah. on. And he, you know, I kept the company car and I took the summer off. And then I went back to work for this facilities company in New York called Unitel Video, which was the largest production facilities supplier in the world at the time. And they had 42 edit rooms in New York, 10 video stages, 12 uh, uh, mobile units, and plus a whole operation on the West Coast. 
And um, I worked for them for six years, and eventually, after a couple of years, was head of sales and marketing for the entire company. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a public company. I wasn't getting, I, I was hired by one person, then someone else came in who was from the company who I did really well under, and we performed well together. And then a third person came in, and we had never gotten along in the 18 years he had been there and the six years I'd been there. And, and it was, yeah, it, yeah, you know it happens oh, in this yes, business happens, all the time. It happens all the time. I do want to ask you before we get into, because not long after that, you actually joined Screen Gems. Yes, at that I point did, about a year after I that. want to ask you who Bobby Brooks is. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby Brooks is a top 40 disc jockey from Hartford, circa 74, 75. Yeah, Bobby Brooks was you <laughs> yeah. in WPOP, right? Yeah. WPOP, the music station. <laughs> how many of those, how many times did you ever have to change your name? Is that, was that the only one you did? No, because I worked at that station under three names in five years. <laughs> <laughs> I started as with my real name, where they're promoting the fact, 16-year-old disc jockey, right. Bill Vassar, blah, blah, blah. And I worked there one summer. New program director comes in. He goes, Bill, I'm sorry, I have to let you go because no one under the, 18, under the age of 18 should be on the radio. So come back when you're 18 and I'll hire you back. I went and I worked at other stations. There were plenty of jobs at oh, the yeah, time. Yeah. So when I was 18, I came back and he said, okay, fine. Uh, but your name's going to be Michael Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, really. Uh, and, and I worked for a while. Then he got fired. Then I got let go. And I was part time. Right. And um, and then a really good programmer came in in '74, and he hired me. And how I ended up with the name Bobby Brooks is they had jock shouts done to go with the jingles for all the jobs yeah, that were there right and then he had a few extras done oh really <laughs> for the people that would be coming to work there i remember i had my choice between dale denver or bobby brooks i said well bobby brooks really pops yeah dale denver doesn't nah. Nah, <laughs> that, that's, that, that's, that's and something, um yeah. that was a really really one runs really well run station it was owned uh, at that point by merv griffin uh he was involved he really loved really yeah he really loved performing for the community Merv Griffin was a brilliant oh my Lord, businessman. Yes. yes, he was. He knew how to, he, he would buy low and got out before it got high, but he still made a lot of money. Well, many uh, uh, many of the older fans uh, know, remember his talk show that he had. Oh, yeah. At, at one point, because he got, he got all the big, he, him and Mike Douglas at the time mm -hmm. were the two big talk show mm -hmm. hosts. And then he went on, obviously, to, to, to produce some of the biggest game shows that ever were. <laughs> he was so smart. Yeah. Uh, I, I recently, there's a great interview on the Internet of Griffin being interviewed by Tom Schneider on The Tomorrow Show. And the two of them and the banter going back and forth, it just it doesn't stop. And it's entertaining and it escalates. It's it just Merv Griffin was so good at what he did and he was so comfortable in his own skin. Do you know who the host of the Tonight Show was before Johnny Carson? Um, it was Merv Griffin. Merv Griffin filled in after really? Jack Parr. I didn't know that. And um because Carson had a certain amount of uh, 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 time he had to stay off the air. Non compete or something like that. Yeah. Um, when he left doing game shows at ABC. Yeah. And Merv, the people all knew who Merv was. The people that he interviewed really enjoyed being on the show and interviewed by him. And then NBC moved him to an afternoon talk show mm -hmm. in the same studio that Carson was in to do The Tonight Show in New York. Yeah. But no one knew who Carson was. And Merv was still getting all the good guests. Yeah. So he tells a story about how there's a lot of friction between him and Carson. That's uh, interesting. I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah, definitely. That's a lot. Uh, um, you joined Screen Gyms in 98. Yes, I did. Okay. What did 20 you, years ago this 20 month. 20 years ago this month. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank and happy you. Happy anniversary. Thank you. I once had a job for less than an hour. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. I took a, took a job. Um, as an afternoon guy at a station in Springfield, Mass. And I had been doing afternoons at another station in Springfield, Mass. And these people offered me a bit more money. So um, I got to the job. And I'm starting the afternoon show at uh, at uh, 2 o'clock. I think it, worked, it was to do work 2 to 6 or 2, two to, to 7. Yeah, yeah, it usually was. Yeah, 6 to 10, 10 to 2, 2 to 6. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And um, so the owner comes in my first day, you know, about 40 minutes into the show. And he so there was a contract in front of me. I said, what's this? He goes, um, oh, it's your contract. And I'm thinking, I've never had a contract in radio in my life. It's always been, uh, what do they call it, free? You're free to you're work right. and come yeah. and go as you please. Right. Yeah. And um, I'm reading it, 
And I go, wait a minute, it says that I'm working at night, not during the day. He goes, oh yeah, next week you're moving to night. So I said, I can't work at night because I've got three days a week I work in Hartford from 10 at night till two in the morning, and that job in three days a week pays more than I make here. Yeah. He goes, well, read a little further down the, the, the <laughs> column, uh, the, uh -oh, down I the page. I know coming. You can't work within a 50 mile radius yeah. of Springfield. I said, I looked and I said, this record will take you up to news at the top of the hour. Yeah. And being a cocky 19 year old kid, I walked out. Yeah. <laughs> and left yeah. the owner to have to take over the show. Oh, man. Um, and then I, wa then I drove a mile to the other station I had just left on Friday mm -hmm. and said, have you filled that job yet? And they said, no. I said, would you hire me back? They said, yeah, $10 less a week. <laughs> well, the lesson learned. It was a lot of money back then, yeah, but you know, yeah. I was only supporting myself and my car and a very small rent as a roommate. So We're back in a moment with the second half of our conversation with Bill Vassar, the head of EUE Screen Gem Studios in Wilmington. But first, I'd like to ask you a small favor. Please subscribe to the One-on-One -on -one with John Evans podcast on whatever app you use to listen to us. The more subscribers we have, the more recommendations we'll get as we try to bring in new listeners. And I'd also like to ask you to let me know what you think of this podcast or any others that you listen to. Reviews are very helpful. And again, that will help with recommendations too. Now, back to our interview with Bill Vassar. And we'll start the second half of our conversation by finding out how he got the job with EUE Screen Gems 20 years ago. It's a great story. Um, George Cooney is a legend mm -hmm. in the Boston, in, in the Springfield. <laughs> in the New York City commercial world, mm -hmm. let alone the facilities world. And he ran what was EUE, Elliot Unger and Elliot, which at, in the 60s was the largest television commercial production company in the world. And they had their own studios. And in 19, somewhere in the 60s, um, Columbia Pictures bought 50% of EUE. And changed the name to EUE Screen Gems because Screen Gems was the television uh, moniker for the television division of Columbia Pictures. In 1981, 82, 83, uh, Columbia decided they were going to be sold. And they were having problems with the exchange, uh, uh, the um, Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, there was um, uh, some weird things going on with the manipulation of the stock. It was some junk fund guy had buy it, bought it. So um, a big investment banker came in and bought controlling interest and then was packaging it to sell. And Columbia Pictures got sold to um, Coca-Cola Entertainment, which was a new entity, but Coca-Cola wanted right. to get into it. They did one movie in all the time that they were there, which was <laughs> a movie with Bill Cosby, which is the only movie he ever did, and it did not work. So um, during that time, the, the Coca-Cola didn't want the commercial division. So George bought the commercial portion of that company and took it private. And so he had the studios in New York and he had the commercial division, which 20 years ago was still really very, very right. profitable. And he, um, I, at the time I didn't realize that his manager who ran the studio facility as well as being his COO of the whole company with a lot of different responsibilities he had just given his three-year notice three years notice he worked many many years for George yeah and he George breeds loyalty with mm -hmm. his people I mean I've been there 20 years which yeah. is miraculous for a guy that once had a job for an hour yeah um so George called me up out of nowhere and asked me to lunch in fact, I wasn't at home at the time. My wife took the message and said, I got this call from this guy. He's just so nice. He was asking me about the kids, and he's so personable and warm, and he, he said he'd like to talk to you. And it was, I guess she had talked to him, it was like 7 o'clock at night. But he said he wouldn't leave his number because he said he was in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had told him a bunch of weeks ago to call you and he just got around to it. So he said he'd call you next week when he's back in New York. I only knew of the legend of, of, of George and the number of years that he'd been so successful in New York. And he, um, 
he and I had lunch, and we just talked. Mm-hmm. And, I, and in that year that I was self-employed, and I was doing a lot of different things. I was uh, working with an Israeli company to do virtual set production long before. <laughs> yeah, C- CAG came in. Yeah, yeah and that, that we were just uh, taking repurposed uh, Israeli flight simulator technology <laughs> and oh. applying it to uh, – to, to TV, but I, I had a contract with CBS sure. and sold a, one of the units to WCBS in New York. Um, it was doing a lot of things. I, I built uh, edit rooms for Major League Soccer, um, and I was using this proprietary software for different projects for different networks, Did a lot of stuff for MTV. And so um, I was telling George what I was doing, and I was you know, offered an opportunity to take on the uh, – uh, the the payroll for a network that was starting a talk network on cable but didn't want to be unionized, so they were going to farm out the labor, but they would really manage the labor. They just needed someone to payroll it. I said, you have to have two weeks of the payroll in the bank, and I don't have a hundred grand. My first meeting with him, he goes, oh, I'll go down and sign the bank note if you want. <laughs> and I'm like, what does this guy want from me? Yeah, He's it's way it's, too yeah. nice. Yes. Well, anyhow, we ended up over the course of about five or six weeks having three lunches. And the third lunch, he goes, hey, I'd like to have you in the company. Why don't you write down what you want? And uh, I said, well, what's the job? He goes, a ah, little sales, little management, this, that, and the other thing. And I got there. And we, he, we, we cut a deal. And uh, I negotiated it with who I was really going to directly report to mm-hmm. who was, had just given his three-year notice. And um, I started off in an office. He apologized for where the office was because it was way off. It couldn't have been further away from his office. He said, I'm going to get you. Oh, you're good. <laughs> I'm going to get you down. Fr- yeah, talk with my hands. That's, that's just, me too. For those who don't know what's going on, I just knocked the mic. Yeah, that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, he said, it's going to take me a while. I've got, uh, we were doing the, uh, guiding light soap opera at his studio. And he's like, I, I got to talk to them and move some things around and make some deals to get you on a, 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 a place up front. But I'll get you up front within three months. And I'm thinking, three months? But three months and he's still going to be getting me settled in? It's like, I, I didn't understand, but he was really looking at this as the long term. Long term, yeah. And he eventually put me in the office across the hall from him. And I learned so much from this guy. I thought I knew how to do business. And it basically came down to being smart, having information, access to money, and be ethical. Mm-hmm. Don't lie, don't cheat. And I mean, we today are doing business with the third generation of people that are in the media industry. Yeah. Um, we ourselves are kind of second generation. We've we've been yes. two generations of the whole deal. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Um, did you did you? As you're getting started in that, and as you're in New York, and I imagine doing a, a lot of those projects, uh, first time you were starstruck by somebody who walked through a studio? Letterman. Really? Absolutely. Um, Even though he was much younger and kind of still getting it. I mean, he had done Indianapolis and had done some TV. I, I but he was see hope, and you know, I worked with bringing Donahue from Chicago to New York, and... Um, the one I didn't get in to do was a great story. You get a call one day, and I, hello, this is uh, Mrs. So and So from Sinatra Enterprises. Oh, hi. I said, um, we want to talk about renting Studio 8H on such and such a day for, uh, or using 8H on such and such a day for a um, rehearsal. Frank's doing a benefit, needs a place to, rep- to, to record the, or to rehearse the orchestra. And uh, I said, okay, let me check the schedule. Oh, it's available. I said, well, <laughs> let me put together some pricing. Oh, no, no, no. Talk to so-and-so in the corporate office, and he'll give you a billing number. So I call this guy. I go, what's the deal? He goes, well, when we had Frank as a host of a variety show back in the 50s, mm-hmm. one of the deals was that any time he was in New York and had to rehearse his orchestra for a benefit, he could use a studio for free. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a nice clause to have yeah, in your deal, yeah. isn't it? And I did not make it to the studio to see Sinatra that day. That well, what, would have been... What about, Letter, what about Letterman? Just <sighs> I was a fan from the daytime show. I got a call from a friend of mine who'd been in an accident, and she says, Bill, you've got to come home from work one morning at 10 o'clock and see this. It is like nothing you've ever seen. It is hysterical. 
he's breaking all the molds. And once I saw the show, it was like, you know, it was playing to those of us in our 20s yeah. or, or younger. Yeah, I was in college, used to watch it in college before mm -hmm. I go to class mm -hmm. in the mornings when mm -hmm. it first got started. And, and um, you go back and take a look at some of those uh, shows, Early. and they were very messy. Yeah. And I just, I don't know, there's, uh, someone just wrote the definitive book on the first years of Letterman before he went to CBS. And it's just great. It's full of stories about mm -hmm. how they were just winging it. Yeah, <laughs> just but, totally but winging, that winging it. was you could tell he was doing something different. He was yeah. tra changing yeah. the, the the venue, mm -hmm. as it were. So as I had become a fan. Mm -hmm. So when I got to the network, and I could sit and watch the monitor in my office during rehearsal, it was the, one of the biggest thrills. Yeah. So when I got that job, working on the audio crew for the strike, it was great. So they told me, you, you, you don't want this job mixing the show. Go, go up and run the PA for the audience. I go, I trained and qualified to mix for millions of people. I'm, you want me to mix for 180? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Go up there. You'll come down in six weeks when the other guy fails. We're going to bring somebody in, a pro from the outside. <laughs> because he said, no matter who sits in that chair, Paul and David are not going to like that person because it's not their guy and they're not going to mix the show the way that it's always been mixed. And Paul was very precise. Yeah. And at that time, you know, you did everything. You mixed the show and the music. Now it's all, you know, in those shows it's all separate. So um, I was absolutely thrilled. So I'm working in the studio and at the PA, when he came in for rehearsal, if he had a rehearsal at 2.30, um, I started to have eye contact with him. So he would recognize who I was. Now I've never talked to the man. Yeah. But once he started to recognize me in the hallway with a little nod, it was like, oh, yeah, my gosh, heart. my heart. <laughs> I went to the next to the last show at NBC, which was what, in the 90s. And um, he comes out into the audience. He does about 40 seconds. And then he has his whole routine of how he walks and where he picks up his jacket and where they put up his tie. And I was sitting right next to the area that he would turn and go down th through the stadium seating to go backstage. Uh, and that happens exactly as the music comes up. Um, and I'm there with uh, uh, my wife. And um, he starts to come down the stairs, and he, stop he stops, wow. looks back, and gives me a pat on the leg and a thumbs up. And even as I'm telling that story now, <laughs> I just get chills. He, w he, he is such an innovator and s changed things so much for television and so reverent about who came before him. Mm -hmm. um, he, I, I, I don't think we'll ever see anyone like him, but then again... I could tell how big a thrill that was for you, just sitting here yeah, watching you kind of get emotional about it. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I, I used to be able to go up and watch the music rehearsals on Thursdays for Saturday Night Live. I, I sat up there and was like amazed and watching Tina Turner, but I wasn't starstruck. Yeah. Not like Letterman. Yeah. When you got the opportunity uh, and with Screen Gems to come to Wilmington, I guess it was 2004, did you... 2006, but I was or, working here prior to that. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, did you have an idea of what had gone wrong here in the past that you had a plan to try to turn it around with Carol Go and, and, and uh, DEG and everything else like that? Um, yeah, people don't realize that we're the first company to make that place work. Right, yes. Dino went bankrupt, Carol Coe went right. bankrupt. Um, George didn't put it to me like that. He, first he said, go down and talk to them, you know, once a month about marketing and, and get to know the people that were here, which included Frank Capper Jr., who mm -hmm. was a marvelous man. Oh, yeah, and just, uh, that, oh. That's, that's one of the highlights of my life was meeting him and, and mm -hmm. getting to know him. And working with him and being in the office next to him. And I just, can imagine. The stories are just, and he was so good on camera. I'm so jealous of how good he was <laughs> on camera. Um, but I mean, but you could, I mean, aside of the name, you could tell that he got it. Yes. You could tell that he understood the industry. And that came, obviously, from, from being in the family. But he was just a, a nice man on top of everything he else. He was a phenomenally nice person. People would walk in and say, I have a script. And he would say, come on and let's talk about it. Probably never have a chance of ever being produced. Yeah. But he, would, he was such a giving 
yeah. caring person. One of the first things, and I want to get back to the Carol, but one of the first things my kids were growing up in, and It's a Wonderful Life is obviously a lot of right. favorites of many people. And we had the chance one time to take the family to one of the showings they mm-hmm. had where mm-hmm. he would talk afterwards yes. at UNCW about it. And having my kids, and, and at the time they were, you know, not nearly as old and mature as they are now, but that's one of my favorite stories, is being able then to tell family and friends that, you know, Jonathan and Monica and Abby, even though she wasn't, you know, maybe, you know, not that old at the time, eight, nine years old, that they met Frank Capra Jr. It was one of those times where I, I kind of stood up a little bit taller, mm-hmm. but he was nice enough to make oh, that happen and, and be able to take that time. He had incredible stories. I mean, he was Hollywood royalty. Yeah. And my favorite is um, his father's on set working with Jimmy Stewart. And <laughs> yeah, just Jimmy Stewart. Just Jimmy Stewart. And his mom calls and says, we can't go to whatever tonight because the babysitter canceled. I can't find anybody. So... Frank Sr. hangs up the phone in the studio, and Jimmy Stewart goes, what's wrong? And he goes, well, my wife and I are supposed to go to such and such tonight, and the babysitter canceled. And he goes, oh, I'll take care of the kids. <laughs> <laughs> and he had more stories like that. Oh, you, you know, Jimmy yeah. Stewart was your babysitter one night? So Awesome. It's just, awesome. So let's get back. I didn't okay. mean to take that sidetrack. But so you were uh, – you came down here yeah, to what, try to what see what happened was I was I, I ended up – I was being trained – after about a year to take over the management of the facility in New York, which was a big television facility. Mm-hmm. I'd never worked in film or, or uh, film-related television production. And he had me coming down here just to talk to Frank and to the, the general manager about how things worked and, and just getting to know the feel of the place. And then eventually, after a few months, uh, I was signing off on payables to give me an understanding of what was being spent and see if I could perhaps find ways of, you know, saving some money. And, um, and I started to find a lot of systems that could be put in that would be effective. But the biggest thing was, I think it was Paramount came in, and I want to say they did a John Travolta yes. movie, yep. and they brought mm-hmm. their own equipment from New York. And I went, well, this isn't good. I said, that's where you make your money. Because yeah. I came from television, and it was how many cameras, how, how, how many videotape machines, how many microphones, you could rent them in a small space. And here, we're just renting big boxes. Yeah, the space itself. Yeah, we had yeah. some equipment that was left over from Carol Co. and Dino, but we weren't in the equipment business, the Letty and Grip business. And I went, went back to George, and I said, you know, if you go and work on the Paramount lot, you can't bring your own equipment. You have to use theirs. Why are we allowing Paramount and those large companies to come here and bring their own equipment? Mm -hmm. So we ended up getting into the lighting. And that was the turnaround, you think? It definitely was. It took a number of years. Uh, Eventually, George put me uh, fully in charge of the operation uh, with Frank. uh, But I was doing both New York and here. Well, okay, let's talk about that. As somebody who grew up in the Northeast, worked in New York City, the decision to come here and based full-time out of Wilmington. What was that like? It was not my decision. It was a joint decision with my wife. Okay. (laughs) She liked it? Well, it was more than she liked it. Uh, We lived about, she was from Dallas, and we lived less than a mile from her sister. And they, together, had four kids in five years. And they were co-mothering four kids. So the first time George came to me, and said, uh, I'd like you to move down there. And it was, who wouldn't want to live here? Yeah. Uh, and I'd yeah. been spending a lot of time here. And I went home to discuss it. And um, she was not enthusiastic about it. Really? Not at all. She'd never been here. Yeah. So the next day I go in to George, and he goes, so what'd she say? She said, she doesn't want to do it. And she, he goes, well, I guess that's the answer. And I'm like, this guy is in it for the long haul. And he went through three years of seducing us <laughs> by sending us to Wrightsville Beach on the beach for the month of August for three years. Really? And my wife and my kids kind of got used to the place, realized it wasn't that bad. And then he came to me and said, I need you there. The soap opera's 
going off the air. Mm -hmm. I need a full-time sales guy here, an operational guy. I need you to finish what you're doing in North Carolina. Um, And I went home and I talked to my wife and she said, well, I was expecting this to come (laughs) at some point in time. Uh, The kids weren't real happy about giving up uh, their friends, specifically my oldest who was entering sixth grade the next year. Um, But it's, it was a great experience. Yeah. I, 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 I want to finish up my career here. Yeah. And, and it is. I mean, I've been here now 26 years. Oh, and it's, it's one of those areas where, you know, I've had opportunities and, and, and time. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I haven't wanted to move the kids. And that's always because the first when I got into television, the first three sports directors I ever worked under were all divorced with children because of, because of moving. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's, it's difficult. And we, Sheila and I made that decision that we were going to try to do that as less as possible. Um, how long did it take maybe for the kids to, to accept as, you, as, as mom and dad told them they were coming down here? Like any teenagers, preteens, they had their highs and lows. Mm-hmm. Um, our, uh, we were, we're in the Hogger District um, we sent them to, to private junior high. Um, and my oldest, uh, he didn't connect at, Har- at Hoggard. And we ended up sending him to boarding school where he excelled. Um, my youngest, he did really well at Hoggard. He wrestled. He was involved with the friends. And mm-hmm. uh, Hoggard was a great experience for him. Yeah. Uh, and, but Hoggard, for my older son, had gone through a lot of changes in a very short period of time. Mm-hmm. I think they had four principals over five years. It was not what I call stable management. Um, so you know, Dr. Sullivan, who's there right now, is, uh, is marvelous. He's yeah, really so turned the school around. When you came in town, obviously uh, it, it, Screen Gems and the studio is a draw. Uh, when did it start taking some of those next really big steps? Was it Dawson's? Was it some of those other well, projects? Well, Dawson's was a successful show and one tree hill was a successful show but those were singular successful shows at one time um we did have a number of movies before i had gotten here and the place was jamming and the question that george had how can we have three major films in a television show and be losing money Mm -hmm. (laughs) so that's when i started to get involved um when i had been down here a short period of time he goes, what's it going to take? He goes, what, what's it going to take? The next, what's the next step? We're buying equipment. We're getting, but what's going to put us over the top? I said, well, you have all this uh, business that started to go to Canada because of their incentives. I, I think you're just not going to have to bite the bullet. I'm, and I'm being sarcastic. Mm-hmm. You know, get a lobbyist and force the state of North Carolina to have a film incentive. He said, go back to North Carolina, <laughs> hire, hire the best lobbyist you can find, and make it happen. It was like. Right. Okay. I get. Mm-hmm. I had the idea, but it stemmed from sarcasm. And he was like, "Sounds good. Do it." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we did it. And uh, thanks to many local politicians like Danny McComas and, and Julia Bozeman and uh, um, the state seeing the importance of the film industry, uh, and the the uh, incentive got better and better over the years. And you know, recently we had some stumbling blocks because new uh, new blood in the legislature didn't quite understand it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we have really good politicians here now: uh, 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 Michael Lee and uh, Ted Davis, and um, that have band together to kind of force their party mm-hmm. and force their hands. And there's a better understanding. When Tom Tillis came out when he was here a few months ago with yeah, the Chamber we, of Commerce and yeah. said it was a mistake. Yeah, we, inter- we did that during that interview. He told us that day it was a mistake to do what we did at that time. Yeah, and so uh, I, I think they're, they're, they're understanding. And they see the amount of business that has gone to Georgia. And we're just looking for enough to keep the place three quarters full. How difficult, and, and we've had to call you for interviews, and mm-hmm. we've had to call you for statements when all this was happening, when the incentive was going away. How difficult was it for you, because you came out with some strong statements during that time as it was happening, but obviously I'm sure they were watered down to how you really felt was this was going on. How much did you have to bite your tongue to be politically correct as a lot of this was happening? Oh, 95 <laughs> <laughs> percent. My, my tongue was sore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but you have to be polite. You just have to be polite in dealing with these things. Whenever you get angry, you create scars that never totally heal. So um, just 
you have to play nice but be firm. Mm -hmm. And eventually it, it's, it's worked. And what is the future? What do you see as the future for the studio here? Is it, I mean, we have projects coming back, not nearly to the extent of the Iron Man and some mm -hmm. of the others, but... No, we'll never see another Iron Man, nothing of that large a, a, a project because the incentive doesn't invite that sort of work. Um, but it's all television now. There are 500 scripted television shows on the air with all these services, the Hulus and the Netflix and the, uh, uh, um, it, it's just amazing. And there's more going on all the, uh, all the time. I mean, Disney buying Fox because they're going to start their own streaming service. Um, it's, it's, it's just amazing. And this is not Dawson's Creek type investment. It's big, big investment in production. We, the big hump that we got over in last year's legislative session that ended a year ago was doing away with what was called the sunset mm -hmm. so that the incentive grant renewed every year. So $31 million came back into the incentive every year, which all of a sudden major TV studios looked at it and said, oh, we can stay there for five years. We can go there. We can build the sets and build off it and s establish locations, certain places, and know that we can stay. Yeah. Um, then HB2 hit. Well, actually, HB2 is before that. Mm -hmm. And the film and television industry is full of creative people that were not comfortable coming here. Yeah. And I don't think anybody envisioned the passage of HB2 to be as big a deal as it was or to hurt commerce as much as it did. And so we had to get over that hump. Yeah. And it's not, in many of their eyes, still 100% repealed. But two things happened. Because HB2 had slowed, slowed things down because of uh, uh, views. The first year of money in the reoccurring we didn't spend it. So right. now it rolls over. Yeah. So there's over $60 million sitting there. Mm -hmm. And there are people looking at us and figuring, oh, the money's there, and it's reoccurring, and we can keep a TV show there for five years? Yeah. It, it's, let's just say it's happening. <laughs> what's on your... What's on your bulletin board? You hear a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things you read that Hulu scripts are coming and somebody said something about Swamp Thing coming. So what's on your, what's on your bulletin board? It's, th things are coming. Okay. Yeah. There, yeah. There are, I, I, I'm not at liberty. To, no, I, and to, I wouldn't put things, you in that spot, but you hear a lot of things. I'm like Wilmington's a, being mentioned again. It's being considered again. Yeah. Consider the fact that I run a hotel. And if you call the hotel and say is... Uh, is Michael Jackson staying there? Mm -hmm. Well, the hotel can't say, yeah. What room is he in? I don't know. Right. I can't reveal who my clients are until mm -hmm. they want to reveal that they're going to be here. Gotcha. Suffice it to say, though, that, that Wilmington is back and, and on back on the... The on phone's the ringing again. Yeah, good deal. So. When you drive down 23rd and you make that turn into the studio, are you as excited today as you were driving in that place 10, 12 years ago? It's a different sort of excitement. It's a pride in my staff. It's a pride in where we've come from. I have a staff, and it's not a large staff because we don't make film and television. We provide equipment, big security department. We do do the accounting for the whole company there. Um, so it's, it's about 26 people. But I very carefully crafted who they are. When I first came down here, I'd say to somebody, uh, how does that, oh, that's not my job. Mm -hmm. No one says that anymore. Um, I have an opening for a position right now, which is a specific technical position, but that job isn't busy all the time. So I'm always looking at what else can that person do during slow times? And I've been interviewing people and, and uh, saying, would you be willing to help out on the phones and, and payables and such. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do anything you need. That's what everybody's like. I, I've got a 26-year-old woman running the lighting and grip department. I don't think there's any lighting and grip company in the country that has a woman, let alone somebody under 40. And she was a UNCW student, came to us as an intern, wanted to work in the lighting and grip department, um, did her internship, did really well, got along with everybody really well, was a 
somewhat motivative, motivative leader and um, continued to work for us down there. And I needed to tie together more closely the understanding of the accounting department and the lighting grip department. The importance of building correctly mm -hmm. <laughs> to get the sure. money. Yeah. Um, and when she graduated, we hired her on in the accounting department because she knew the equipment and she knew the software. Well, let's teach her the accounting software so she knows the process all the way through. Right. And then I put her down there as, I, I think it was, uh, lighting and grip administrator. And then when our lighting and grip director left, we put her in charge. So you, you're basically playing with your own players now. You, you're yes. basically got your own team yeah. members now. Yeah. She, and what's interesting about her is uh, she's played basketball all her life. So she knows how to play on a team. She knows yeah. when to pass the ball. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she was most afraid that the guys, and she's got you know, a couple of guys in their 50s that work for her, wouldn't respect her. I said, they want you to have the job because they don't want it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't have a better person in that job. And that is that way throughout the entire company. What does Bill Vassar do when he wants to kind of just relax? Or do you actually have any time to relax? I do have time to relax. Um, I listen to podcasts. Do you? <laughs> I do. I listen You're going to subscribe to the one-on-one -on -one with John I Evans am podcast? now. I didn't know until a couple <laughs> weeks ago that you had one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I really enjoy podcasts. Is it amazing to you what is out there now content-wise compared to when we were starting in radio 35, 40 years ago? Unbelievable. And the talent that is, is doing podcasts. I, last week I started listening to something called Zigzag. And it's two women who worked for 10 years at WNYC Radio, New York Public Radio. And they've left to start their own media company. And they're starting from the beginning of getting financed. And how scary it is, how scary it is to leave without a, you know, they both have kids, they're both married, how, how, how scary it is to leave without a paycheck. Yeah. And they're really good storytellers. They're really good storytellers. I'm a major, uh, I think my first addiction to a podcast was Mark Maron. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's got almost a thousand podcasts, uh, interviews done. And that all was born out of not having a job. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I like this. I like this because I can. I mean, where else was I going to learn that 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 Bill Vassar started in radio and <laughs> and learned how to edit audio tape with a razor blade and scotch tape the same way I did? I did. I yeah. had no idea you had a radio background. And it, it's interesting. My sister was in radio. She's ten years younger than I am. She was in radio for for a while and did news. And um, during her days before she went to grad school, I I, I went in to see. I, I didn't recognize the radio station. Yeah. This doesn't look anything like where I worked. You know, mine was two turntables, four yeah. cart machines, yeah. the, the the mixing board, and picking your own music. Yeah, I mean that was my f last full time radio job, and uh, and that was sitting on fifty thousand watts in New Haven and having been the most popular young adult uh, uh, radio station in in Connecticut. And Long Island. And Long Island. <laughs> to right the over time. the sound. I appreciate you taking time. You're so busy, and you're a leader in this community, but it's been fun learning about you and learning how you've developed a career that started in radio and is now in uh, Screen Gems in Wilmington. I've also been blessed with just being in the right place at the right time, like telling that NBC story. Yeah. Had the opportunity. The door was cracked open. I was just going to do everything that was necessary to get the job done. And uh, I, for people starting out, it's like, I, th I don't know if it was uh, Woody Allen that said, 95% of life is showing up. Mm -hmm. I've showing got, up on time. Yeah, I've got an intern now, comes in 15 minutes early. If she's given a task, she'll stay an hour late. Um, she's definitely, I got my eye on her for when she gets out of UNC. Is that what you tell when somebody asks you to tell or talk to college students or high school students, the advice you give them? Yeah. You have to have a passion for what you do. And usually that work ethic, I find, is, is um, encouraged in the home in high school or even before. Uh, I asked her if she'd be available for part-time work uh, during the school year, and she gave me a schedule. She, I said, now, will this interfere with your regular work? She said, oh, no, no, no. I said, she goes, I, I've always worked two jobs. I said, no, not your other job, your school work. She goes, ah, I'll get that done. Yeah. And it's just she's got this work ethic which is not as common today as when our generation, which had been raised by the depre depression. Yeah, the greatest people, generation, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and there was 
they they knew the need to work to get your food. Yeah. Um, well, we uh, I certainly wish you and uh, the wife and the kids all the best, and I appreciate you carving out some time. It's been fun to get to know Bill Vassar. It's been great. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Thanks, John. Bill. Yep. Thanks to Bill Vassar for spending some time with us here on the podcast. You can follow the latest news on the EUE Screen Gem Studios in Wilmington by logging onto Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. There's accounts for the studio on all of those social media platforms. Next week, a man with many talents, a North Carolina native. He's a casting director, a famous one in New York City. He's an artist. He's a producer and a director of many independent films. Daniel Peddle will join us here on the podcast. And among the things we talked about is how he gets his inspiration from his many trips to Carolina Beach. I remember the first trip I ever got to go on to um, you know, the far end and see the hermit's bunker that really made a huge impression on me, um, as a child. And, um, I, I also, I remember, you know, the, the, the boardwalk before it, you know, it's been beautifully renovated, but, you know, there for a while it was sort of trapped in time. It was almost like you were stepping back into the 1950s. That's producer, director, casting director, and artist, Daniel Peddle next week, right here on our podcast. Hey, do you know someone who you think would be a good interview for an upcoming episode? Please let me know who it is. Send me an email, jevans at wect.com. I'm John Evans. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's episode of One on One. (laughs) 